testing. Ian? Oh. There's no light on the podium. It might need to be plugged in um, just so I can read my notes. But yeah, I'll show you. It's, it's all right if it doesn't work. And <laughs> I think you need to remove that. <laughs> so can this plug in because like normally there's a light <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're ready. <laughs> okay. And Ian, anytime you want to dim the lights, go for it. Thanks. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for your patience as we worked out our um, last-minute technical details and cleared the stage so you can see the images. So I'm David Stark. I'm Chief Curator, and I'm delighted to uh, be able to speak to you today prior to our uh, concert of music by Tchaikovsky by members of the uh, Columbus Symphony Orchestra um, uh, to talk to you about images of Napoleon in art, in painting and sculpture. And this is a uh, part of our uh, Mozart to Matisse program, an ongoing program. Uh, this is our first uh, such program in the year 2020, so belated uh, Happy New Year. And um, the uh, topic today is related to the performance uh, this past weekend as part of the Russian Winter Festival, uh, January 24th and 25th, of Tchaikovsky's Overture of 1812, which was about the defeat by the Russians of Napoleon's troops when they invaded in 1812. And my final image will directly address that particular defeat by Napoleon, but I'll spend most of the time uh, in the brief uh, uh, 20 to 30 minutes that I have to talk to you uh, prior to the uh, musician's performance, uh, talk to you uh, and show images that were contemporary with Napoleon. And they'll show his rise to power. And uh, then in about midway through, I'll look at uh, images that were done decades following the final defeat of Napoleon at the Bat Battle of Waterloo in 1815, when there was a wave of Napoleonic nostalgia, and conclude with a work that was done a couple decades before the first performance of Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture. And uh, so here is the, uh, the string quartet, the program that you have, hopefully, uh, that was distributed to you. And here we have a map that shows the extent to which this uh, originally uh, obscure general who rose up through the ranks during the French Revolution and... Oh, sure. Yeah, it looks like we've got colored lights. I think they're left over from Wonder Ball when we had a very different kind of program. So, Ian, uh, do you have any control over the lights that are directly in front of the screen? Oh, I see some dimming. <laughs> they're colored lights. <laughs> they're uh, red and blue. Okay, is that better? Okay. Great. Um, so the map uh, shows the extent to which Napoleon's um, invasion affected Western Europe, beginning not only with the country now recognized as France, but uh, going into Holland and Belgium, uh, uh, parts of the Adriatic coast, parts of Italy that were directly part of the French Empire, and then these uh, light purple areas were under uh, French dependence, and then allied with, the, uh, with Napoleon are the green areas, uh, Germany and uh, parts of 
uh, uh, Scandinavia. And then this trail to Moscow shows the ill-fated uh, invasion that did not go very well for Napoleon and his troops. But the rise to glory uh, is chronicled by the uh, French neoclassical painter Jacques-Louis David, who as an artist rose to fame as a, um, uh, an, a painter who depicted uh, either overtly or in uh, ways that were elusive uh, to the French Revolution, to the radical uh, program of uh, uh, liberty, equality, and fraternity, um, championing uh, French radicals, including those who died uh, during the revolutionary struggle, like Marat. And uh, after uh, the revolution fell apart, David, the artist of this uh, uh, depiction of Napoleon on horseback, was imprisoned and uh, was almost executed. But when Napoleon rose to fame, he readapted his style and iconography or uh, treatment of subject matter and symbols to glorify Napoleon, who he looked at as a new uh, French hero. And so Napoleon rose to fame through invasions of Italy, Egypt, uh, eventually assumed control in the French capital. And one of his early campaigns in 1802, when he uh, crossed the Alps, the Pass of St. Bernard, uh, you see depicted on the right, showing the emperor in a way that really wasn't very true to life because he was on a mule, not a horse. And um, uh, the horse was enlarged. Uh, I'm sorry, Napoleon was enlarged in relationship to the horse to make him look more dominant. And, <laughs> um, but you see the um, heroic nature of the depiction in terms of his monumental scale in front of these tiny soldiers in the background. And the inspiration for this equestrian depiction of an emperor goes back to the ancient Roman Empire. This is the only statue left standing during the Middle Ages post uh, the, the fall of the Roman Empire in the ancient world, Marcus Aurelius, because people thought it was a statue of Constantine, a Christian emperor, so they didn't dare destroy it. But at any rate, uh, this was in part the inspiration. And if you notice, on the bottom are stepping stones that the horse is going over, showing by implication the uh, great predecessors to Bonaparte that included um, uh, Charlemagne, the great uh, uh, French emperor of the um, Middle Ages, and Hannibal, the ancient Roman general who famously crossed the Alps into northern Africa, and then his own name, Bonaparte. Well, he uh, uh, declared himself emperor uh, in uh, 1804, and he was commissioned by David several years later to depict his coronation, not in Reims, where former French kings were crowned, but rather in Notre Dame in Paris. And so you see him in the process of uh, crowning his queen, his wife, the Empress Josephine. He already has a crown on his head of laurel wreaths. He fancied himself as uh, the successor to Roman emperors, and whereas the Pope uh, would have, oh, and by the way, um, Notre Dame was um, remodeled, or there were, it's uh, almost it, like stage props, the, the uh, Gothic uh, architecture of the uh, structure was covered by these uh, temporary round Roman arches and pilasters and classical elements to obscure the fact that it was a, a Gothic cathedral. So important was it at the time for the neoclassical Greek and Roman aesthetic to uh, predominate. And the um, crowning, uh, you see a detail uh, is uh, taking place here. And then in the back is the Pope who was, uh, for all intents and purposes, pushed to the background. Um, he would have uh, normally done the crowning, as had been the case in the year 800, when Charlemagne, uh, who I referred to earlier, the, one of the 
great predecessors of Napoleon who united France for a brief period in the early Middle Ages. Um, he was crowned by the Pope, but the um, Pope is uh, seated, raises his hand in blessing, but it, he doesn't look very enthusiastic because he's simply pushed to the background uh, for the greater glory of Napoleon. So this is a, a, a huge painting and a um, in, in, in emblem of the propagandistic and powerful nature of art by David that supported the power of Napoleon. Now, here he is uh, more unceremoniously in his studies where we're supposedly capturing the uh, uh, emperor in a more private moment in 1812. And he's showing him, uh, he is shown in uh, his... Uh, uh, uniform, but less uh, ceremonial or, or, or less formal garb. And the idea is to show him as a man working hard for the French people, uh, working through the night. The candle has almost burned down. He's been up all night slaving away. Um, so it's 10 after 4 in the morning. You might have thought, well, did he get up really early at 4? No, because the candle showed he stayed up all night. And what was he working on but the Napoleonic Code, or the code of laws that he introduced that, were, that was actually a good thing in terms of reforming the kind of um, haphazard random patchworks of laws and policies that reflected the feudal age and uh, the uh, uh, medieval codification of these um, uh, more uh, uh, this uh, disunified, disorganized system of laws is the foundation still for the uh, legal code of uh, France and other countries. So that was important work that he did that uh, is emphasized by David in this standing portrait that is not in France but is in Washington, D.C. at the National Gallery. So this is a, a great French treasure that we have in our own uh, country, in our capital, no less. Now, um, <laughs> here, striking a different note, is uh, the work of a pupil by David, um, Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres, I-N-G-R-E-S, and he pulls out all the stops in showing Napoleon, um, well, as God. Um, <laughs> And I often, this is a depiction of God as part of a large uh, altarpiece by Jan van Eyck called the Ghent Altarpiece. And it, when I'm teaching survey art history courses, I often ask students or tell students, if you have if you ever wondered what God looked like? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, but seriously, he's, uh, it, the, the parallels are uh, too uh, obvious to be uh, overlooked. And... Uh, Part of the evidence for the influence of this painting is the fact that Napoleon was infamous for plundering and pillaging the art treasures of nations that he conquered, including Belgium, or which used to be Flanders, where the Ghent altarpiece is located. And it was taken to France and put in the Napoleon Museum the Napoleonic Museum, which became the Louvre, and he transformed the um, former royal palace, which during the revolution became a public museum, and Napoleon developed it further, added extra uh, additional architecture and so on, and filled it with plunder, <laughs> plundered art. Well, the, happily, the Ghent altarpiece was returned to Belgium. It was stolen again and taken away by the Nazis but in World War II, but it's, it, it remains in Belgium today. And at any rate, uh, notice the halo, the implied halo, um, by the arches uh, in the throne, uh, or of the throne upon which Napoleon is seated. And he's dressed in full imperial regalia. Then, um, speaking of clothing, uh, here is uh, Napoleon Sans clothing. And this is another facet of uh, neoclassicism, the importance that was placed on ancient sculpture and the so-called heroic nudity, the way in which gods and emperors and athletes were portrayed in the nude. Um, uh, gods were perfect. They did not need or require clothing. And so, and the athletic events in ancient Greece were performed in the nude. And emperors uh, were often, uh, the, the, re the similarity of emperors to gods was implied by showing them without clothing. 
and in this instance, uh, the a full-length statue was preceded by a bust that is very similar to and modeled after uh, busts of emperors and statesmen and family members of ancient Rome. Uh, so you see the idealized features and uh, neck and upper portion of the chest of Napoleon here. And then in this statue, he's standing in the, uh, the contraposto pose, the, the standard way of showing uh, ancient Greek or Roman figures with the stress on one leg, the other leg bent, as if taking a step, a very natural, lifelike way of showing figures. And then the, one of the most famous ancient uh, sculptures uh, was uh, the so-called Apollo Belvedere. Uh, so there's a, a definite similarity here, and Napoleon is depicted as a god, depicted as Mars, the god of war, but to soften the effect, he's shown as Mars, the peacemaker. And he's got a, um, an orb uh, in his hand with a small woman with wings, wh which is a victory figure or a Nike figure, the origin of Nike, the running shoes, Nike, the victory, the ancient symbol of victory, a winged woman who would proclaim victory by flying about and announcing whoever was victorious in a battle or a conflict. Um, and he, so here are uh, the couple of depictions of Napoleon in uh, uh, narrative contexts, uh, showing episodes, but glorified episodes, in the course of his military exploits. During the uh, campaign in Syria in the uh, early uh, 19th century, the early years of the first decade of the 19th century, he visited, because there was a, an outbreak of the bubonic plague, he visited a makeshift hospital, it was called a pest house, but it was a mosque that was converted to a hospital. And you see uh, Muslim uh, doctors tending to patients, and Napoleon um, courageously takes off a glove and uh, places his hand on one of the sores of the, uh, one of the victims of the plague as if he had the power to heal. So we saw Napoleon as God a few minutes ago. Now we see Napoleon as Christ the healer. And there's a similarity to the um, uh, famous uh, print, one of the many famous prints by Rembrandt. This is, uh, the topic is Christ healing the sick. It's often called the 100 Gilder print, or 100 Gilders print because of the price that was supposedly paid uh, for it at one time. But at any rate, you see um, the composition divided into halves, a light half filled with by implication, divine light uh, being shown on Napoleon and the miracle uh, that he's performing versus the darkness into which the other uh, figures are plunged. And instead of neoclassical architecture, instead of arches and pilasters and uh, Corinthian column capitals and so on, you see the Islamic architecture of the mosque. And this is an indicator that we're moving into a new movement, Romanticism, where an artist like Gros, even though there are still classical characteristics about his art, um, the, the Romantic generation rejected the classical by and large and sought for other environments and other time periods than the ancient Greek and Roman uh, times. So there were, there were a lot of images of North Africa or the Middle East and in fact, there were so many images of the Middle East, and this corresponds chronologically with the uh, introduction of the French uh, colonial takeover of North African and Middle Eastern countries in certain areas. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the trend is called Orientalism, in which there's this fascination with the, uh, the terrain, the architecture, the customs, the clothing of figures from this era. So this is an early example of that uh, trend in art. And there's also, uh, to drive the point home, about the relationship to Christ in the way that he, uh, Napoleon has shown, you have this image by Raphael, one of uh, many, uh, one of about six, or I think there were eight altogether, uh, cartoons uh, or uh, full-scale uh, paintings that Raphael made uh, that were used 
for the production of tapestries that were hung in the Vatican. And uh, these were, um, uh, these would have been well known to an artist like Gros because they were in London uh, since the 17th century. And by the way, in um, the fall, we will have an exhibition of uh, six tapestries that were based on these cartoons uh, on the second floor of the Walter Wing uh, that are borrowed from Dresden, woven in England in the 17th century and entered the um, what's now the old Master's Picture Gallery of Dresden in the uh, 18th century. So that's something to look forward to in the fall. And we'll have a couple life-size or full-scale reproductions of the cartoons like this, uh, which never leave England, understandably, uh, but we will have the actual tapestries. Now, um, here's another battle scene, or another scene of Napoleon in context. It is the Battle of um, Elau, which was an ill-fated, disastrous um, battle that preceded the Russian campaign in 1812. The French took a, a pounding, and Gros, uh, this uh, artist who did the previous painting, uh, was commissioned to show not the battle itself, uh, the French getting defeated, but rather the aftermath, and showing Napoleon as gracious in defeat. He's in the center, of course, on horseback, and he's instructing the French soldiers to minister to the needs of the Russians who are wounded. So it's a, um, an image of the beneficence and the virtue of Napoleon. And you see some of the soldiers that are approaching him on horseback on their knees as if they are worshiping a saint or a holy figure. And this gesture of blessing raising the hand, you see, as another reference to uh, the, a, a Christ figure or a holy figure. Then I mentioned in my introductory remarks that there comes a time a couple decades after Napoleon's final defeat and exile and death where there uh, comes a wave of nostalgia for uh, things Napoleonic and ages past. It is part of the Romantic movement. And you see here a uh, much more um, prosaic, uh, everyday uh, image of Napoleon visiting the Louvre that I referred to earlier as the um, Napoleonic Museum that he had a role in uh, terms of uh, filling with the uh, art treasures from other countries. And so you see him uh, inspecting the work of Percier and Fontaine. That was the team of architects that also helped uh, reconfigure the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral to look as if it was neoclassical. So there he is uh, Napoleon inspecting a new wing of the Louvre. And then uh, in a, on a more grandiose uh, scale, you see the artist Jean-Baptiste Moses, um, who shows in an allegory in Napoleon who is being crowned by Father Time. Uh, in other words, he's shown as being immortal. And there's a reference <coughs> still, this is uh, 1832, to his Napoleonic code. Uh, he, that's the one thing that uh, Napoleon can still be praised for, despite all the um, humiliation of the defeat uh, and the failures of his uh, ambitions, but the Napoleonic code endured. And here, uh, a, a couple decades later, is a Napoleon as a legislator from 1859 by uh, another uh, artist, uh, Guillaume, uh, Eugene Guillaume, uh, is, was his name, uh, and this was for a private residence in Paris, but it shows in a classical guise, Napoleon, now clothed and not nude, as a legislator uh, with the um, praise being on the Napoleonic code that it, he holds. And then finally, this image that's con connected more directly, well, it's indirectly connected, but chronologically it's closer to the uh, 1812 overture, showing Napoleon in defeat. And coming back from the uh, Moscow invasion, uh, it's such a, 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 a contrast to the 1812 overture that's famous for, it, which is a, a celebration and famous for its uh, cannons, the chimes, the bells, the high volume blasts from the 
brass instrument. Instead, this is a very quiet, um, elegiac uh, depiction of defeat. And we see Napoleon uh, looking very despondent, uh, the work done in a style that still has references to classicism. It's a style that you could call uh, academic uh, realism because this artist, Ernst Maisonnier, by the 1860s, uh, embraced uh, in a limited way uh, new currents in uh, realism in art. Uh, there's, there are romantic elements as well in terms of uh, not restricting himself to uh, strictly classical references, but, but join the um, remote to French people location of the uh, Russian environment. And by the 1860s, the most avant-garde movement w that was developing was Impressionism, which uh, uh, was all about brushwork that was much looser and freer than anything Maisonnier exhibited and all about modern life of the contemporary period instead of going back uh, 50 years to recount an episode from the past. Um, and just to be fair to the Russians, um, here is a Russian artist depiction of the retreat from Russia that shows in much more um, uh, realistic terms the uh, misery of these soldiers who were subject to famine, disease, attacks by uh, Russian troops and Cossacks and are shown here without their horses uh, with uh, considerable more uh, physical misery uh, shown. And it's then coming full circle, uh, what a difference um, a, a decade makes uh, in terms of the um, uh, 1802 versus 1812 uh, incident shown, although this uh, dates to 1862. And just to show how resonant these images of Napoleon are, this is a picture I snapped on a kiosk in Paris in 2017 when there were uh, critiques of the, uh, po uh, the autocratic power, supposed autocratic power that, uh, in, uh, that that uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, was taking. So I, I will leave you with that uh, image, uh, just making the point on how these uh, images of Napoleon and the, the, the legend and the, the culture uh, of Napoleon are still very meaningful for the French today. So I will now uh, uh, cede the stage to our great musicians uh, for the concert portion of the program. Thanks. <laughs> 